Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Beth Burke, and I'm thrilled to be starting a new series all around the great reinvention. So some of you might know me. I'm an author and a researcher around professional identity, specifically hybrid professional identity, where people who wear a lot of hats actually have an integration point between those hats. I think that's your secret sauce and your unique value, and more workers are sort of becoming this new type of identity they can't express, and I call it hybridity. So alongside that, I look at trends that are happening in careers and in the workforce. Obviously, in the last year to two years, we've really seen a ton of energy around the great resignation. And alongside that, though, it's not just that people are leaving jobs, they are reinventing themselves. They are changing their values and their beliefs and their behaviors and asking what do I want to do with my life? And why am I doing this job? And what should I be doing instead? And notice all that is be language, becoming. So there's a lot of identity wrapped up into that. And yet we're not pausing and saying, wow, we're having an identity moment in our careers alongside all the transition. So I am going to be bringing guests throughout the next year who are also in that same zone of thinking about reinvention from different angles. And today I have Carrie with me who is the founder of Women in Leadership Nexus, a really superb organization. We'll hear more about it, so check her out on LinkedIn and her website. And Carrie's also a VP of Growth. She has all kinds of hats and identities, which is one reason we have some synergy, because I do as well. But I love Carrie's thought leadership. She had a really great post recently about what's happening with these hidden doorways in our careers. And she's building a new program around door D as opposed to choosing door A and B. There are other options. So we're going to talk about the future of choice, the future of work, and why reinventing ourselves is a choice that we all can take right now. Carrie, why don't you introduce yourself so people can hear more about you? Well, I'm so glad to be here, Sarah Beth. Thank you so much for having me. Our first conversation, I was thinking this morning that we've only talked, I think, twice. <laughs> Have this kindred connection, which is so special. And I absolutely love the term hybridity that you coined. I think that the minute you told it to me, I told it to at least 27 people oh my God. <laughs> because I felt like you named it, like you named something that I've experienced my entire career, which is I'm not one thing and none of us is one thing. And we all have this intersectionality and these different ways that we give our gifts to the world. So I'm just so honored to be here. I'm such a fan of your work um, and really excited to talk about, as you said, this period of reinvention and choice and empowerment that we have that is probably the most heightened and within reach that it's ever been before. Oh my gosh. It, that, it's so true that it's within reach and yet it's invisible, which I think why we're both so passionate about building awareness and almost shaking people awake to be asking them, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you believing what you're believing? Why are you following the traditional conventional paths? Mostly because we all think that's the way it's supposed to go. And you and I have realized there are other choices, which for me, it's be a hybrid, combine your identities, don't just choose one or do many things. And for you, I think you're telling people, design your own career path. So yeah. why don't we start a little bit with your um, vision of what hidden doorways and pathways means? Yeah, it's um so I I'll start by saying I hate fork in the roads. Like I <laughs> fundamentally I hate the diametric opposition that it creates. And and we've all been there. We've all been at these moments in our career where we get to the fork in the road. And typically it comes from a source of, of pain or frustration or a lack of motivation that we want to choose different. We want to choose next. And there we are. The pathways are right in front of us. And we've seen them before, by the way. Like they're not different. <laughs> they have different casts and different characters, but it's always door A and door B, right? Mm -hmm. Like door A mm -hmm. is this notion of stay the course, make the job work, make your business work. You're falling out of love with something, but hang in there, right? Okay. And then yeah. we've got like door B, which is very close by. It's just a couple steps away and it's do something new. It's, you know, quit the job or start something new with your business or um, just take the step over laterally or a little bit forward. And, and sometimes there's a door C, like very, subtly. And I always describe the door C as this notion of maybe like a lateral move in your organization, mm. or you launch two things at the same time as an entrepreneur. But 
my belief has always been at that fork. There's this invisible door and it's so Mm -hmm. far removed from the others that you literally have to just rewire and commit your brain to seeing it. And it's what I call door D. And I feel like it's this vision that you have. It's emergent. It's daring. It's bold. It's the thing that you've actually probably never told anybody because they wouldn't necessarily understand it. Mm -hmm. They're not two, it's your invisible door. And my worry is that when we get to these fork in the road moments, whether they're to move us away from pain or towards gain, we still see A, B, and maybe C. And I want the conversations and the mindset to shift to invisible pathways that I believe actually represent the grandest, most divine Mm -hmm. vision that you really want to take. You're just, you're terrified because no one else has taken it before. You illustrated that perfectly. I was tracking every door in my brain going, yep, I know door A and B and C. And I didn't know door D was even out there. It's so beautiful. I love what you're doing. And well, this your work, your work, Sarah Beth, though, like what I love is I remember when I first heard about your work and you talking about hybridity and I thought, oh my goodness, like this is part of the fork in the road issue, yeah. is the way we think of identity. And it's forcing the constraining diametric opposition of, well, if I go here, I'm this human. If I go here, I'm that. And it impacts the choice so profoundly. So you made the best segue. I was just going to connect your stuff with mine that we're both talking about these binary choices and boxes. So my framework goes like this, that we've traditionally thought about two types of workers in the workforce, i.e. which work identity you can be. Choice A is singularity. You have one professional identity. I am an engineer. Choice B is multiplicity. I have many professional identities. People say, I wear a lot of hats. I'm multi-passionate, multi-hyphenate. I'm a polymath, a jack of all trades. But then there's this other identity, the third one in your language, the Dordi, and mine, it's it's that emergent, who are you at the intersections of multiple professional identities? And people go, what? I didn't know I was allowed to combine and intersect. And really you're integrating. And when you do that integration point, it is a third entirely new identity that we don't know what to name. It defies language. And quite literally people are afraid to use their imagination that it exists, that it's possible. But when they're in that space, because I've seen this so often by working with people, they truly come alive. They are bringing their best parts together. It's the sum of your parts is bigger than the part alone. And suddenly you are your fullest, truest professional self in your work. So there's no denying there is a lot of impact and results when you get there. But allowing yourself, having the permission, the awareness and knowledge and tools even is where we have a deficit. Like this is just not part of career literature, language, coaching, you name it. So I think, yeah, go on. Oh my gosh, I love love what you said about the best parts of yourself because the best parts of ourself cannot live in a singular container. We're complex human beings. There are multiple layers of how we process and get stimulation. And the boxing in and the definition, the forcing us to define you nailed it. It's granting yourself permission to say, what if I chose the best parts of me? What if I chose the intersectionality? And I remember when you said to me, you get to choose to be a hybrid. And it's like you Mm -hmm. gave him that moment, Sarah, about this this language that I had never really understood of why I was struggling to explain the fact that, yes, I I run a women's business. I run growth strategy for an awesome tech and advisory services firm. I'm now launching a new program (laughs) that I can't wait for. And I, you, you almost feel a shame cycle, I think, with mm-hmm. hybridity and choosing it because it's not yet normalized. And thank goodness for people like you and this body of work, because, you know, you've kind of, when you choose hybridity, there's judgment in every way. There's a lot of, I think, self-judgment you put on yourself of, well, am I choosing hybrid because mm-hmm. it's safer or because I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket? And other people are looking at you wondering why you're not just choosing one. And I say, like, we have to challenge this system Mm -hmm. that's asking us to choose, which is what you're all about as well. Um, Choose what you need. Choose the best parts of you because all of the things that make me who I am, I can't get it in just one zone. And I don't want it in one zone. Oh, this is superb. And we've got some great audience people watching. So thank you, everybody, for chatting. And if you have questions, you can add those in. Carrie, I, I want to come back to what you just said, this notion, because I want to argue a little bit. I think there is a lot of shame embedded because people are trying to express who they really are, but we have a, a lack of language. And so you say you don't like the expression, the fork in the road. I say I don't like the expression, what do you do? 
because we define ourselves by skills and job titles and we never actually know who we are in our work, which is your professional identity. And so people lean on these really old catchphrases, like these catchphrases need to go away. I wear a lot of hats. I'm a jack of all trades because they don't mean anything. Everybody has accumulated multiple professional identities at this point, most people I'll say. So if you get stuck in that layer, which is 90% of LinkedIn, if you looked at headlines, everyone has a list of identities and things they do. It doesn't make sense. It's confusing. So I argue that the next layer is the integration. What is the synergy between? And I teach people to use a phrase, I work at the intersection of X, Y, and Z. And they have to get clear what those foundational identities are. And then they create a new space. It's that new option that you're like, well, what is the intersection of being an artist, an educator, and a researcher? How do those fit together? Because that's what happened to me. So I, I want to kind of shift into some of the stats and what we're both noticing currently, because I think we both share a, um, an interest in futurism. So we've seen a lot of things like, I think in November of 2021, four and a half million people just resigned their jobs. Um, the great resignation, obviously, a lot of people dropped out of the workforce for a variety of reasons. But this job transition moment is so heightened right now. What are you seeing and sensing with people you've talked to, Carrie? Yeah, it's it's a really fascinating time <laughs> that we're living through. And none of us have lived through this before. So there's really no blueprint to follow. And I, I'm sensing right now there's an exhaustion. And, and we were talking about this, Sarah Beth, the other day, that it's almost like we need to take a collective breath. This is hard. <laughs> Life is really challenging. There is just unrelentless pressure and you know turbulence that continues to persist but i also am excited that i think the people that were already starting to think and shake and shatter their brains the way we're describing to start to challenge the status mm -hmm. to throw out these old catchphrases that have no business <laughs> living in our world anymore. i think they're awake and i think the challenge now is going to be can you drive yourself to dive a little bit more into that feeling because it's super uncomfortable like whether we're talking about choosing door d's or hybridity or read defining your professional identity. This is hard work because what it's requiring you to do is confront the systems, the old institutionalized knowledge that you have, the biases that you're holding onto yourself and to mirror it back to you to say, well, wait a minute, why am I still choosing my career in a certain way? Why am I making choices based on a, you know, a set of parameters? And that's that's hard. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. It comes with more risk because you're asking your, your brain and your operating model to choose different, to choose a path that you've yeah. never experienced before. And I constantly think about this moment in time, great resignation, as you said, the surge of entrepreneurship. And the hope I, I guess I would have for everyone is we all too often find ourselves in this same exact situation a year from now, two years from now, but literally the people have changed. And that's the only thing. And then we wonder, why am I here again? Why am I feeling that same sense of not being fulfilled in my job, not loving my business, feeling like I've got to make a change again? And I think it's because we're in the same pattern and we have to do a pattern interrupt. It's hard. Oh, oh, I got chills on that one. My language around this is that we're at a career paradigm shift. And so we are living at the precipice from the old to the new. And we do have to question these systems that are so ingrained. And it's almost a generational stereotype of you're supposed to go to school, get a degree, start a career, stay with it for 20 or 30 years and retire. And the truth is no one's doing that anymore most people feel strange, like they're a misfit that, well, what's wrong with me that I'm changing jobs more often, or I'm in a whole new industry, or I'm unhappy. And they have these, these moments where they're questioning, and then they go and find a career coach or a life coach or whatever. And the missing ingredient that I perceive in all of that, it's healthy, actually, to go through these developmental resets. They are identity moments. It's a developmental thing to explore and reconsider who am I now than I was five and 10 years ago. And you're at a new place of yourself. But we don't actually bring identity research into career development and workforce training. We focus on what new skills do you need? What's wrong with you in a way? What's missing in your resume? What are you lacking? How are you going to sell yourself more? And I believe the experiences you gain along your career path are then something you have to reintegrate internally to say, 
I need to see myself. I need to do some really deep meta awareness and reflection on what this all means. And then when I have an understanding of my professional identity, I can come back out and put myself into the world to attract or go after or you know, start to flirt with new ideas of different paths. And that to me is part of this career paradigm shift, going from what the world tells you to be to who instead you want to be inside all these traditional systems. Oh, I love that. There's two phrases you said that I, they're making me feel just so, so drawn to it. The two words you used are, are attract, right? What can we attract in? And, and I want to stay there for a moment because your circle of influence is so, I think, underestimated of how much it will shift the paradigm for you or keep you right where you are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've always, when I talk about the women leadership nexus, when I talk about my leadership beliefs, you need to be really careful with that circle. Because if you want to start to see invisible pathways, redefine your identity, celebrate these new, you know, defining moments that you're realizing about yourself, you need the right circle around you to attract mm -hmm. that and to mirror it back to you. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first started to change my circle and wanted to hang out with the disruptors and the catalysts and the people that honestly scared the living daylight <laughs> of me because they weren't going to put up with my old, you know, business etiquette that I had learned and had been so deeply institutionalized. It becomes contagious. Like if you meet one of those people, you meet the next and you meet yeah. the next and your whole orbit changes. Mm -hmm. Like it's wild to watch mm -hmm. it happen. So that's how the you and I is of the world meet, right? And now we already know our circle is about to increase tenfold. The region. I so I love what you said about the attracting in. And mm -hmm. the second thing you said that just so deeply struck me is this notion of flirting with new opportunity. And I, I smiled because I thought, oh my gosh, how how awesome to make this a, a choice, like a choice mm -hmm. to, to go there and peek in and then kind of go away if you want. And then, you know, go over there and kind of dance your way through it. Um, mm -hmm. Because I do believe there's this rewiring that can happen and we know it, right? We know how neural pathways are built. A lot of us mm -hmm. know kind of base level neuroscience that if you start to, you know, change the way you make decisions or you change the way you're um, making assumptions about how you want to lead your life, you activate a whole new set of thoughts patterns that were like either suppressed or you never knew existed. So mm. love those two words that you said. Oh, this is such a good conversation. You know, Carrie, when I start my work, when I do presentations with people, the question I usually kick off with is what is your professional identity? And it's such a sort of simple sounding question and people will put it in the chat if it's virtual or, you know, we'll have a little conversation. And most people tell me, I've, I've never been asked this question before. Would, am I supposed to answer it with the, what do you do? And they'll tell me a job title. They'll tell me a discipline kind of, the, oh, I'm in marketing, I'm in sales. And I go, but that's not your identity. And they go, well, what do you mean? And it's like this moment they're, they're like, I've never thought of that question. So talking about the rewiring, it really starts with some different kinds of questions to prompt and provoke new insights about ourselves. And then people tell me, Sarah Beth, okay, I get it. I think I'm a hybrid professional. I'm, I'm learning how to, how to merge and talk about my intersection of my identities. But when I go to my manager, if I go to my employer, they're not going to get this. Like, what do I do with that? And I go, first of all, if you are not able to articulate this and clarify it to other people and they still shut you down, then you are not working in the right job with the right people. Because if you need to be seen for your full self in, in this hybrid way, you need to be surrounded back to that circle of influence by the people who get it and accept you and embrace you because the hybridity is your value. Anyone that's trying to go back and compartmentalize you and say, Carrie, that's nice, but we just need you to do this one thing. Just do, just simplify and, and less complexity, please. You're <laughs> never going to be satisfied. And yet so many of us are sort of reluctant and holding back and we're scared and we go, oh, okay, I'll just pigeonhole myself again because I have to fit that career because that's what people say I need to do. And so you're disempowering yourself in those moments in what you want to do in your career. You, you absolutely are. I mean, think of the very definition of a hierarchy and an org chart. Like it is literally designed to box people in and tell you this is your lane, this is who you report to, this is who your cross-functional team is. And that was what titles were, right? Like titles, let's be real, were created eons ago <laughs> to allow certain people to do command and control style. Oh, yeah. and, and they haven't been upended. I mean, we've upended them in trying to say, well, let's get rid of, you know, 
titles that are executive in, in front of what the person does, or you see these really cool new age titles now, it doesn't change anything. We're still trying to title people. And to your point with the what do you do question and how you open your work um, and asking people to start to ask different questions of each other to get to new levels of insight, yeah. people are starved for this. And I, I've come to find through my work, and I know you can feel similar, that when I hop on calls with strangers, I never ask what they do. To be frank, I don't care what they do. <laughs> that tells me absolutely nothing about who they are and why I want to have a connection with them. Mm. And I just embarked on a 30-day challenge I ran on LinkedIn where I got virtual coffee with 30 strangers mm. in 30 days all over the globe. Mm. And I was really clear in my ask. I said, I just want to connect with strangers. I believe in random collisions and that you can meet one person and your whole life can change. Mm. And I had this feeling I was supposed to meet certain people in this challenge. And I remember mm. hopping on every call. And the first thing everyone said is, I don't know what I was supposed to do to prepare for this call. Wow. <laughs> I was like, you don't have to do anything. I mm. said, you're here. I said, we're just going to talk. Yeah. And I the first like 60 seconds, they're nervous, right? They're mm-hmm. nervous. Am I going to have to talk about what I do for a living? Where is she going to take this thing? Mm-hmm. And we just had at it. And we started sharing the deepest parts of our souls with mm-hmm. strangers. And I thought, this is why we're starved for this. We are starved mm-hmm. for whole self, as you said. We are dying to break out of these boxes yes. that people are trying to put us in and mm-hmm. just connect at the intersection and the whole self parts of us that are beautiful waiting to come out. Oh my God, everyone wants to be seen. Oh, it is just a human desire that when you are seen, it feels so good. As a side note on Hulu, there's this guy, Derek Delgadio, and I always mispronounce um, the title of the show. I think it's In and of Itself. It's something close to that. And he did an off Broadway performance that got recorded, and he starts with all these I am statements. And I don't want to spoil too much, but he ends the show using those I am statements that every audience member chose, that they're all different identity words. So you can see I was already like, oh my God, I love this show. And he looks at each individual and says their identity and it is emotional and you just see them change and the power of being seen. And that is why this work of you are more than your job title, hence the title of my book behind me. I I needed that for myself. I felt so trapped in these old systems of hierarchies and social order and organizational systems. You're a program director, you're a teacher, you're this. And I was like, but I'm more. And how do I talk about that? And how am I valued for that? And why do I feel less than? Ah, It's good work. It's, I agree. And I, I'm, I'm saddened by how much we hold the beauty of ourselves back that like only certain subsets are going to get to receive it if you choose compartmentalization and silos and to to limit who gets the parts of you. And I think if you decide as the human that you want the intersection and you want everything on your choice, your relationships are just going to be so much more nourishing. Your career is going to skyrocket and you're going to change the people around you. I mean, this work is truly infectious where if you start to model this out to other people and normalize everything we're talking about, it starts to shift this thing. And we start to see that the great resignation, the surge of entrepreneurship, there's a deeper reason (laughs) that it's happening. And if we get to the deeper reason, it's because people aren't happy. People are buying their whole selves. People don't feel seen to the point. And we know how incredible it is for those that are experiencing it. And and for me, my my biggest thing I'm hoping is that we close this chasm. Like Mm. I feel I feel so jolted always every morning to think that there are the vast majority of people that are over here and they show up at their jobs and their businesses one dimensional and mm-hmm. holding back and, you know, really trying to play the system that we were taught to because it rewarded certain behaviors. Mm-hmm. And then you've got this other group over here. I mean, we're hanging out over there. <laughs> and half the time people are like, what are they doing? Like, yeah. how, do, yeah. how do they run their careers? What's going yeah. on? Um, and it's not always something we can explain because we know it and we're living it. And I just want that divide to be. Yeah. And I really think that there is a greater fulfillment mm-hmm. and happiness that can happen as you move over here. You know, that's an interesting expression, close the chasm. In my mind, I don't know if that's what I'm after. I don't know if I'm trying to close mm-hmm. the gap. I actually just want to go to the next level. I'm like, those of you that are over here in this old camp, great. Like you stay there, but the rest of us, we're phasing out of that. We're moving into a new territory. So it's more of the innovation adoption curve. Like early adopters come over here where there's an uprising of what it means to have a career where people invent 
what they want and how they do it. And everybody else, you know, if you're in the traditional bucket, you're there. Um, Carrie, I wanted to shift into what do you tell the disbelievers? What do you tell people that don't get door D or they're like unsure? Because I have people come to me about this hybrid professional identity thing and they go, well, I like, how do I find a job that allows me to be hybrid? And I'm like, they are out there. The yeah. minute you actually, first of all, start talking about yourself as being a hybrid, you can explain the intersection of how your identities fit together. And you can put that into, I give people an elevator pitch and you start saying it out loud. It changes the way people see you. They will, you will make sense in a new way. And in addition to that, jobs are out there that are hybrid jobs. They are looking for people that are one part anthropologist and one part NBA and one part designer, which makes no sense. And yet someone fills those ingredients. And that is a hybrid job that is perfect for someone with those kind of disparate identities. So I think it's just opening people's eyes that this is out there and it's possible. They've just never thought about it and they've never had the training to do it. So what do you tell people on your side? It's a great question. I I think door D is a choice. So I try to start mm -hmm. there. I actually think that seeing it is just the first part, right? Mm -hmm. And and I've really studied over the last five years, the futures movement, my work through Nexus of being able to work with hundreds of leaders over the globe to understand what you need to change in your operating model mm -hmm. to start to see invisible doors. Because I do believe that it's not something that you wake up one day and say, I'm going to see invisible doors. <laughs> like there is, there is work, there is reprogramming, there is rewiring. And that's mm -hmm. the methodology that I'm passionate about teaching now. Mm -hmm. But the second part is you have to choose door D. And so when I've launched my Door D program, I started with C Door D, which is just the first part of this, which mm -hmm. is how do you learn how to change that state of being so that invisible doors, it's almost like that cloud gets removed. <laughs> the, big, the big reveal will be there. Mm -hmm. Because I remember when I saw my first Door D, that's literally how it hit mm -hmm. me. And then the minute I saw one, I started seeing them everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is I want to help people choose it. Because you are going to see it if you put in the work. I think it's 10 times harder to choose it because mm. choosing it means to choose something that others are not choosing and mm. to be where you're saying on this surge of innovation and advancement. And what I'm most passionate about right now with the futures movement is if we're too late to seeing invisible doors and choosing them, we are we are going to fall so woefully behind with our careers mm. and businesses, we won't be able to catch back up mm. because the future of work is going to reward the door dears and the people choosing their identity and mm -hmm. empowering themselves to see differently. Yeah. And this old model, it's not going to stand a chance soon. No, so no. There's, a, there's a real urgency that, that I've been feeling recently to oh. help people spot this sooner. Oh, I'm just, I'm enamored with this. I hadn't thought until you explained it that there's multiple door Ds, that once you see the first one, then you can go through and then more and more and more show up. And I'm like, that makes total sense. It's not just one door that it's a cascade of new door D's that you're finding in your life. I'm, I'm like, I want to go find my door D's. What are my door D's? I'm sure I've had them. It's, well, it's so cool to hear you echo that back because I think when I took my first door D, then they all started appearing and I thought <laughs> I can keep taking door D. And I love that when I first told my friends about this years ago, they made it a verb and they were like, are you going to door D this right now? <laughs> Um, so I, that's where I geek out, right? Like I just want people to understand that the invisible paths never close and, and careers don't close and opportunity doesn't close. That's the old, again, way of thinking. Yeah. Um, and that the minute we start to take those steps towards invisible and new, it will become easier to do it over and over again. Such a good statement. Um, I want to wrap us up a little bit and maybe leave with some future thinking since we like thinking about the future the, the final thought on my mind I wanted to just get out is this idea of emergence. It's a really key word I've come to love and share because we all aim for outcomes. Like we say, what's your goal? What are you trying to hit? And that to me is very linear thinking. Like, you know, what is going to be in the future and living in these spaces I'm assuming from your point of view, but I'm, I'm hearing it. And definitely from mine with intersections, the emergence is the unknown thing that is birthing forward that if you have the space and you have the strength to let it like percolate and, and you can hold fear at bay, because I think fear is the thing where we run back to the conventional traditional, but the emergence of who you are at your intersections helps you give new language to a new identity, a new job title, a new career path. And then that will keep unfolding and escalating. So I think the future of work is really about allowing things that have yet to be created be your next future step 
and getting more comfortable with that. What do you think on your side? Oh my gosh, yes. Like creationism and emergence. Mm -hmm. I love those words. And and choice, right? This all keeps Mm -hmm. coming back to the opportunity landscape is the Mm -hmm. most vast it's ever been. And I want people Mm -hmm. to really sit with that for a moment that you can literally walk away from a 20 year career doing, you know, finance and go do something else tomorrow. (laughs) You can choose to have your own business and work for someone else's business. You can start to put into that vision, everything you've ever wanted that Mm -hmm. is consciously being kept at bay for so long, because to use the word you said, you need strength and space, which way you said, right. To allow that to come in. Mm -hmm. Um, And the fear is going to be there. It's always going to be there. Fear (laughs) is always telling you something amazing is on the other side of it. So I just hope people realize that we are in a revolution. It's an awesome one. It is finally upending a system that took hundreds of years to be upended. Mm -hmm. And this is the time. This is the time to, I'll go back to your word, flirt with new opportunities. (laughs) Try to stretch a little bit, see what you can attract in and start to challenge your mindset to say, Mm -hmm. what am I not seeing that is literally within my fingertips right now? And if you choose for one moment to believe it's possible, you already unblock parts of the brain that need to come forward to even give that voice to to come to life. I love that. I mean, we really are ushering in a new era. This is beyond career coaching, everything you and I are talking about today. And that's something else I want to leave people with. Like, I think there's a new emergence of professional identity coaches that need to come forward and be educated and credentialed somehow. And I think from your point of view, it's helping people see choices and options and the opportunity, career economy, whatever we're going to name that, the door D land. Um, Carrie, this has been fabulous. I would love to let people know how to follow up with you um, after today. Yes. So I am currently kicking off my first door D cohort. I'm looking for my first door Ders to formally go through this program. It's 12 weeks. It's to teach you the methodology to see invisible pathways. The uh, application window is open till January 31st. And then the cohort's going to kick off mid-February. I am looking for 10 unbelievable humans <laughs> that are ready to do this work. Um, and I, I'm excited to see what is brewing for yeah. these humans and, and what are they wanting to cast into light that has never been voiced before. Oh, it's going to be an exceptional group. So you can see her URL right there and then follow Carrie. This is her social handle. Is it Instagram? It's Instagram. Yes. And then LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you want to find me, would love to connect. And likewise, um, follow me at more than my title. I put out a weekly newsletter and there's a book all about how to find your hybrid professional identity. And I run courses to help people go from this space of, I don't know what my professional identity is or what that means or how to put it in the world. And answering what you do is giving me anxiety. And I, I'm a jack of all trades and I work and help people have all the tools to go from your multiple hats into your hybrid professional identity. So come to more than my title. Carrie, this has been a huge pleasure. Thank you so much for this conversation. Oh my gosh. Thank you. This was amazing. Um, Sharing space with you is the best. So I so appreciate it. We have to do more. I know we will. (laughs) Okay. Thank you everyone. Bye.